that as well as the concentration on the surface. Simple example is uh, if you do a hematocrit on a disc, you can just make a compact disc. That's literally a modified compact disc. Um, and using something called a capillary burst valve, which is in here, you pattern a region of hydrophobicity, and then the fluid won't go through that until it reaches a certain RPM. So you can use that to meter out a certain volume of blood, and then you can just read off the, the hematocrit after you spin down the cells. It's not that different than what you do in a capillary valve. It's an example of the kind of control forces you get. You get new phenom phenomena. Uh, so the field that I work in is called deterministic lateral displacement. It's a terrible long word, but we call them bump arrays. Um, there was, once we wanted to call them tango arrays because they kind of go back and forth. That didn't stick very well. Uh, some other things, I've actually cut the slide on inertial separation to save some time because I see we're all running a little long. Uh, and of course, there's labor saving potential. You don't have to look further than the agile bio analyzer, which we use in our group. Uh, to do various assays, uh, and that's got uh, microfluidics at its heart. So the, the first example of microfluidics to try and make maybe care about the field a little bit was a paper from, in Nature in 2007 from a group in Boston uh, who I know and tried to work with a few times. Um, and it's, uh, they, they did isolation of, and they used some very similar technologies, so there's a lot of synergy. Um, isolation of circulating tumor cells from whole blood. Is anybody familiar with this paper? Wow, okay, anyway, so it was a big deal in our, in our field, because it might be <laughs> it in nature very often, right? Anyway, so, but it was shocking because they found way more circulating tumor cells in whole blood across a broad range of tumors than you would expect. You know, 10 per mil for colon cancers, prostate cancers, lung cancers. Way more than people thought. And then they correlated really strongly how many you found in blood with the size of your tumor mass. So they could put you on chemo and they could reduce the size of your tumor mass and they saw the number of cells in your per mil of blood dropping and then it would go back up if, it, if the cancer came out. Uh, and the, the heart of the technology is some pillars, really simple stuff, etched in silica, coated with an antibody. So it's classic smart surfaces. But the pillars create a really huge amount of surface area interaction. So as the cells go through these things, they're literally dragged across the surface of every pillar with a lot of surface area interaction. And that basically just makes them stick better than it would on a normal, say, capillary or parallel plate system. Um, so and then, of course, and the other thing is you can take the lid off and they go back and go with confocal microscopy and do labeling and determine really what kind of cells were sticking there. So they can you know, take out the, the non-specific adhesion and things like that. The next example from the field that I thought was really neat and uh, was caused a lot of excitement. And there's no way any of you would know what this one. But if you've got a, if you want to make a miniature flow cytometer, okay. So normally flow cytometers are kind of big things. People have been wanting to make small ones for a long time. You need a good way to sheath the sample. That means put the sample surrounded by fluid, so that all the cells going through the detector go through the same speed. If they're against the wall, like they are in the Agilent bioanalyzer, the Agilent bioanalyzer has a flow cytometry chip. And they have a simple system like this where the cells come in one side and the sheath comes in the other side. And that puts all the cells up against one side. So some go faster than others. So this can add noise to your detector because different fluorescent, just fluorescent cells go by quickly, gives a smaller signal, goes by slowly, gives a bigger signal. So a group in uh, the Naval Research Labs created a, a simple little structure here and this was, uh, you know, this was built, working on other, building on other people's shoulders, but they realized its potential for sheathing. You put enough of them down there, it wraps the central fluid, your cells, in buffer. And then because it's all laminar, you can duplicate the exact same thing, have the stripes going the other way, and you get your sheath fluid back. So you can recycle the sheath fluid. So normally when you run flow cytometry, you've got to run a liter of, of, of saline an hour, right? You know, and if you want to make it small, you can't. These liters of things, you want to lug them around with you. So with this system, you can get back 90% of your sheath fluid and just keep running it. So that was a, I think these two things are really key if you want to make a, a small flow cytometer. Well, I suspect the Agilent Bioanalyzer chip, if it survives another five years, will probably use this technology. Okay, so cutting to the chase of the thing that I had sort of inherited during my PhD, there was a guy, he did it as I left, and then we all decided, hey, this is pretty cool, we'd like to work on this. And I said, we've got to get blood in this. <coughs> I was working with blood 
blood and he invented this thing called polystyrene beads and he said, we have to get blood in it. Um, so it, it works a bit like this. If you've got an array of posts, you know, kind of like the other chip had, and it's periodic, so that here you've got a, a periodic row system where you get back to the same place you were after three rows. Then you can divide up the flow that goes through each gap into three flow lanes and, and they go through cycles. So the first flow lane goes to the third flow lane, and back to two, then back to one. This is from the 2004 science paper that I had nothing to do with. Uh, so I should have a thing, I'll put it in later. <laughs> if you're a small particle, then you can fit within this flow lane, and you go through and you hardly even notice the posts are there, you go straight through. If you're a big particle and you don't fit in the first flow lane, you stick in number two, you're always in number two, and you go at an angle. So the, the bottom left one is one from one of my favorites, but I, I like what they did here as well because it numbers the flow lane. But so you can separate large particles from small particles by an angle. Let's call it theta. We generally make it one over the tan of the angle, one over an integer, because then you get this periodic system, and that's really key. Okay, so you have small particles, you have large particles. You can there's a transition from being small to being big, and that can be quite sharp. So you can really just separate. Everything below a certain size goes one way, and everything above a certain size goes to another place. And that's at some critical size called d, d sub c. <coughs> Sorry for the equations, but anyway, we'll get off that path. And that's proportional to the gap times some function of this thing we call epsilon or the slope. Um, and you can use it to do a sort of like spectroscopy. You can put in a, a, a mixture of different sizes, and, it can, and if, you, if you engineer the post, right, you can spread those out into different size groups. Your white blood cells by size by microscope. But you, in this way, you separate them as you measure them. So white blood cells, leukocytes, you know, 6 to 12 microns. Um, larger cells exist with increasing scarcity, things like macrophages and things like that. Some tumor cells are abnormally large. Uh, and activated lymphocytes, as they go back to being a blast or a lymphoblast, where they can get bigger too. And, and we can actually, we've seen that we can add an activating chemical like, an enter, like Staphylococcus enterotoxin B, which causes your lymphocytes to activate. And then you get a shift in the size of your CD, I think in that case it was CD3 population, but it could be CD4. And of course, separation is inherent in this process. Quickly, this is sort of what the chips look like. You have a, a long skin <coughs> thing because the angles tend to be low. Uh, in this case, we, we have a narrow injector again because we want to do this high resolution spectroscopy kind of thing. Put buffer around on either side. Small particles go straight through and big particles go sideways. And so then we map out where different cells go. So the, the, the red ones were CD4. Lymphocytes, you just put flow cytometry dyes on this. It's really easy. Put it under a fluorescent microscope. Repeat it a whole bunch of times. Most of this is my blood. Um, the blue is CD14 monocytes from, from fingers, too. Although we did play the work with venal blood. But, uh, and then we also put in some abnormal lymphocytes. This is a cell line. Uh, it's J45. They're really big. That's why we use them, right? Because <laughs> they make a nice picture. And uh, the cell size, of course, if you measure correlate really nicely, not only with flow cytometry <coughs> in terms of forward scatter, but just what you measure on a microscope. So we did the same. We, in parallel, we did forward scatter measurements, and you get just these almost identical groupings. OK, another application, measurement of blood platelet activation. So we know platelets are small. They're sort of one to three microns, disc-shaped things. And they change shape when they clot or when they get activated. Um, measurements of that function is important for lots of things I won't go into. But, um, but few methods exist to assess plate function, and, and it's really hard to assess plate morphology unless you get an S, uh, you know, a good electron microscope. But this, we found, can actually sense the, the, the shape change. You can see the shape change. So this is the way this chip worked. Again, we have the same thing, a, a little narrow injector with buffer uh, on the sides. And the first thing we have to do is actually we separate the whites from the reds, because the whites are big, and they would they mess up in the experiment. So this figure on the left, the blue is the, is the Hertz labeled white blood cells. And the uh, red is just light scattered from the reds as they go by. Um, and then we take the reds and we put them into another array where we have this system of, again, this sort of size spectroscopy thing. And from this, you can see the reds all go here, bigger things go here, and smaller things go there. The green is just some one micron beads that just go zipping through and they don't really notice it. Um, so we put in blood, and again, this because you know we're engineers and don't know much about blood. It took us a while to figure out that, for example, we had to use you know, citrate anticoagulants and, and things like that. And we had to keep it warm, so you know, we heat the whole microscope up and everything, and we run it. So we figured out how to do this. Of course, we're, these just SEMs don't mean much, but of course, on a citrate, warm citrate platelets are discs, right? And they're not little balls. And, and the discs can be big. 
they can be like four microns, no problem. Um, now, I've converted what we get out of the chip into a mean size, because we can measure the size using the chip. And what you see is that as you either chill it or you activate it with thrombin, you get an increase in size, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to us. It still isn't clear. Of course, we have theories why it would go up when normally activation causes these things to kind of sphere. They kind of, then they get small. Activated platelets are small. They're like one microns. They got hairs on them. But still, it was, it was neat, and uh, we saw that. So um, what we're currently working on is, is trying to get something to, that will that you can use in the lab that would be, I think, well, I would be excited for. So the first easiest thing is, let's just put blood in on one side, whole bunch of blood, and let's put buffer in on the other side, and try and move the white blood cells into the buffer. Right? It shouldn't be that hard. And we did it. This was part of a project we did with Beckham Dickinson at Princeton. And it, it actually worked well, although then they said, that's great, thanks, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> they were risk averse, I guess, at the time. Um, so, so that's, the blood comes in on the left side, the buffer comes in on the other side, and you can see the red is this sort of red blood cell over here. I think this blood was diluted by about 50%. Um, and it's the buffer here, we actually use Automax buffer. It's great stuff. The stuff that Milton uses for their like cell separation columns, because full of EDTA, prevents clotting, and it's got BSAs, it coat surfaces, it's good for blood like fluid, it's like that. Um, anyway, and at the end of the array, of course it seems quite long, all the white blood cells come out here, and all the reds come up there. So that's great. Now, now I'm, we're working on making this into a you know, a high throughput, you know, user-friendly device for the company in the States. I'll mention that later. Oh, here, let's just have a look, because this is fun. We make videos and it's fun. So there you can see the little whites come down. The reds are hard to see over there, because we don't have much of the blue light, but they're over there. All right, what's next? Okay, so the second project that I've, I've really got my heart in right now um, is to make a little bit a little bit further step ahead than the group than this commercial company in the States is trying to do. I want to get the same thing. I want to get the white blood cells out, but in plasma. I don't want to use buffer. I just want to have a single input, because then you can literally take a syringe of blood, whole blood, push it through this thing, and you get you know, a 20 times reduction in volume and just your white blood cells in plasma. And I think that, that might actually go. Someone might actually pay $5 for a little plastic thing that would do that. Um, so you have to do a couple things. You have to have one array that generates the plasma, so it has to bump everything out. It has to bump all the red blood cells out, hopefully most of the platelets, but they're harder to get because they're smaller. And then you have to push the white blood cells back into the plasma. And there, you got this laminar flowing stream, so you can do that. Um, the challenges are that with whole blood, if you want to make plasma, you have to bring up the hematocrit of everything else. If you want to make 10% of your blood in the plasma, hematocrit on the other side is going to go from 50% to almost 60%. What's going to happen in an array? Well, it might just clog. We don't know. We'll see. You might just jam up the whole thing, in which case you might have to dilute it a little, but hopefully not. Um, and we don't exactly know how the red blood cells behave. Um, we've seen them bump in a, some conditions, but not in others when they should have. Well, what we do know is that if you put blood in capillaries, the red blood cells go through that little parachute. Um, and that's how they get through you know, really small 5 micron capillaries, and it increases their surface area, so you can argue it makes the oxygen uh, the gas diffusion, you know, go up and things like that. We need to do some microscopy and we're going to hopefully investigate exactly what happens when they go through the bump array. And the one thing that will be a little different is that it will be asymmetric. The cells are going to be sitting to one side of the, of the channel, which, which would be interesting. But that's more like the, you know, esoteric thing for nerds like me. Um, so in any case, whichever one of those two things you're doing, you have the same problem, which is throughput, right? We need to get milliliters per minute through this thing if anybody's going to care. And all of these things use low, low separation angles, so they're going to be really long, but the throughput is proportional to the width. And the wider it is, the longer it is. So the only, the only sort of way around that is to use lots of them in parallel. And then you have these problems of connecting the inputs and the outputs and multiple levels and anyway. So the company that we've started working with in the States, who actually own the IP, so you can't really go ahead without them, um, is called GPB Scientific, but they've been really good so far. Um, they're going to make a contribution to our grant book for writing, thank goodness. Um, and so that's a silicon chip that's about that big. It sits in a little you know, thing like this, and you put blood through it. And in this case, they put blood and buffer in there looking to get the white blood cells out. Yeah, they had some problems. They didn't engineer their chips very well. So they, they have room for improvement, but that's what I'm helping them do now. Um, now, my first sort of attempt a, a year and a half ago um, 
similar thing, but 